Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I always come up here and try to be honest with you, and I'm going to tell you up front that, that given a choice, this is a topic that I would not address. The idea of talking about those that inflict harm and hurt upon other people is a very difficult topic for me. And given my personal preference, I would just ignore it and go on. But this particular series, Skeletons in the Closet, demands that we be honest about the evil we see in the world, the evil which has touched our lives and changed who we are. Last week, we talked about abuse. We talked about those who have suffered at the hands of others. We talked about the hurt and the heartache, the, while it's not logical, the guilt that the abuse victim carries, and the feeling of isolation, being absolutely alone. And I I pray and I hope that, that what I said last week resonated, that there's one solid, strong truth that you need to hold on to, and that is that while you may feel alone, you're not alone, because God promises to draw close to us in those times when we are hurting in our hearts or hurting physically. And if there's one thing that needs to resonate in our hearts, it is that God wants us. He wants you. Today we look at the other side of the coin. We look at the abuser. And I would love to be able to stand here and tell you that the abusers we see in the world today are relatively new to the history of humanity. But as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. The abuses we see in the world today have been in the history of the world since the beginning. It crosses all ethnicities. It crosses through all time and history. It is in every culture. There are people who, for whatever reason, inflict hurt and harm on other people. So this morning, we're going to limit our discussion to the Bible, to the individual characters that are revealed in Scripture who were themselves abusers. I think it would be too difficult to talk about modern-day examples for the most part. So where do we begin? I think we go to the beginning, the Garden of Eden. God came into the garden in the cool of the day. Adam, where are you? Adam and Eve ran and hid. I hid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? And what did Adam do in that moment? The woman he was given dominion over, the woman that he was to protect, the woman he was to provide for, the woman he was to love selfishly, he threw under the bus before they had buses. All that mattered to Adam is that God would know it wasn't his fault. I didn't do anything wrong. It's her fault. Of course, God didn't see it that way. God expelled them both from the garden. Adam went from a man who was given the responsibility to love and care for his wife to a man who basically said, you're expendable. All that matters is me. And you would like to think that'd be the end of the story, but we see it cropping up over and over again. Abraham, the father of our faith, Abraham, is confronted with Pharaoh. Oh, she's not my wife, she's my sister. So what does Pharaoh do? Takes Sarah and puts her in his harem. And God has to intervene with great judgment on the house of Pharaoh for Sarah to be restored to Abraham. And he did it not once, but he did it twice. Because when he confronts Abimelech, Oh, she's not my wife, she's my sister. So what does Abimelech do? Takes Sarah and puts her in his harem. Which God has to bring judgment on Abimelech's house for Sarah to be released. What does it tell a woman? When the man in her life who's supposed to love her, who's supposed to protect her, who's supposed to put her first above everything else, says you're expendable. I am the one that matters most. All that matters is that I'm taken care of It doesn't matter what happens to you. I think that tells a woman that she is expendable, that she is, it's okay to be used and abused for whatever he needs. 
And if that's not emotional abuse, I don't know what is. And we see that over and over again in Scripture. How about a woman who is not given any choice who she's intimate with? Do what I say with whom I say. How would that make you feel, ladies? Poor Hagar, Sarah's maid that she got from Egypt when Pharaoh finally said, take her and go. Hagar, you go to my husband Abraham and you have a baby by him for me. I don't care if you don't want to do it. Do what I say. And then when Hagar gets pregnant and has Ishmael, what does Sarah do? She treats her with such contempt, verbally abusing her, physically abusing her, emotionally abusing her, that Hagar flees from Abraham and Sarah. God has to meet her on the road and he gave her a promise. Hey, girl, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your child. Go back and be faithful. And Hagar returns to Abraham and Sarah. And it, what happened with, with Hagar is the same thing that happened in Jacob's life. Jacob's two wives, Leah and Rachel, they're jealous of each other. Well, she's having more boys than I can have. So here, take my maidservant, Billah, and, let, and have, let her have sons through her for me. To which the other wife says, here, take my, my maidservant Zilpha and have children by her for me. They're forced to lie with Jacob and have children because the two sisters are in this jealous competition with each other. By today's standards, we'd call that human trafficking. Would we not? And what about having your own relative, someone you're close to, hates you and despises you so much that he kills you or seeks to kill you. Cain killed Abel. Right? Jacob had to run for his life from Esau because Esau was going to kill him. And they're brothers. Joseph's brothers would have killed him had the traveling caravan not come along and they could sell him into slavery and make a profit over it. Saul hunted David for months trying to kill him. And why? Because they were jealous of each other. Simply jealous. Did not like each other. And because I want to be better than you, I will get rid of you. Here's one you probably don't know. Here's a little story hidden away in Genesis. How about you move to a new area? And your only daughter goes into town to meet the folks in town. One of the men of the city sees her, takes her and rapes her, sends her home. She comes home crying, distraught. Men, what would you do if it was your daughter? What would you do if it was your sister? You know what Jacob does? He goes and meets with the guy's dad. They decide maybe they ought to get married and put away the shame. How would you feel, ladies, to be raped and to be told you have to marry the man who raped you so that no one would know what happened? Diana's brothers had other ideas. They killed all the men of Shechem. Not just the, not just the one that raped their sister, but all of them. Hmm. Then you have the come to David's life. David's daughter, Tamar. Her half-brother, Amnon, David's son. He wants her. He feigns being sick so that David will have Tamar take care of him while he's sick. When nobody's around, he takes his half-sister and he rapes her. She goes crying to her, her family. David finds out that his own son has raped his daughter, and what does he do? Nothing. Just ignores it as if it hadn't happened. Just pretend like everything's okay. Absalom, Tamar's full blood brother, throws a banquet with all of his siblings there and in front of everybody executes his brother Amnon for raping his sister and divides David's family, which will lead to David being exiled and Absalom being held king of the people. 
And let's not forget David. David sees Bathsheba. Can she really say no to the king? He takes her, lies with her. When she gets pregnant, what does he do? He murders her husband, Uriah. And you know what the text said? Bathsheba grieved for her husband. Do you think she really wanted to be with David? You just don't say no to the king. The king gets what the king wants. And he raped a young maiden. Later on in history, the Israelites move further and further away from God. There's a valley right outside of Jerusalem called the Valley of Hinnom. One of the darkest times of Israel's history, they set up idols to the god Molech. The god Molech was a god of human sacrifice. You know what they did? They took their infant children, the little boys and little girls, and took them to the valley and there laid them in the fire alive and burned them alive to honor their new chosen God. Right now, archaeologists have found in the valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, little caves with thousands of little clay pots filled with the remains of cremated babies that Israel offered to their chosen God, Molech. Solomon was right. There's nothing new under the sun. Emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, child abuse, murder, everything we see in the world today is present in Scripture. God has something to say about it. What does God say in His Word? The one who murders is to be put to death. There is judgment on the evil. The one who rapes or commits sexual abuse is to be put to death. The one who uses their power and ability to manipulate and control and hurt others. Jesus said this, You know that those who are regarded as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in positions act as tyrants over them. He calls them tyrants. Solomon said, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. That is true. You can speak to a child in a way to watch them blossom and grow, or you can speak to a child in a way to watch them cower in fear. The person who emotionally, verbally abuses someone is one who is a bringer of death, according to Solomon. There are ample examples, and I could keep listing them. But the real issue for us is, is there any hope for them? Can the abuser change? That's a hard topic. Because everything in us wants to get even. Everything in us wants revenge. We want to see justice in our mind played out. But is it possible for someone who has been an abuser to actually change? I've shared with you about my two uncles who grew up in an abusive family watching their drunken father beat their mother, how they grew up to be men who drank too much and beat their wives. But by the time I came along, they weren't like that anymore. I learned about that after they died. I didn't realize that's what they had been because by the time I knew them, they were respectable husbands and fathers. It is possible for someone to change. Most of those I listed and talked about did not change. Cain didn't change. King Saul didn't change. Joseph's brothers begrudgingly had to give homage to him as second in command in Egypt in order to survive. I don't know if they really ever changed or not. Esau, ironically, did change. When he saw the humility in his brother Jacob, Esau's heart softened and he welcomed his brother home. David grew to truly love Bathsheba, and Bathsheba grew to love him in spite of everything that happened. You see, it is possible for someone to change. But if you have been the victim of abuse, or if you have witnessed an abuser, where do we go from here? You know, it's one of those skeletons in the closet we just ignore. We don't talk about it. We try not even to think about it. 
We try to pretend like, it, like it's something in the past unless it's currently going on and then we put a little more makeup on and hide it. What are we to do? We who understand that there are abusers and have suffered. Well, let me tell you this, and I want to make this very clear. There's a huge difference between forgiveness and restoration. Okay? Forgiveness is about letting go. Forgiveness is about letting go of the anger. Letting go of the heartache. Letting go of the pain. Letting go of the desire to get revenge. Forgiveness is about taking that person that hurt you and entrusting them to God so you can finally be free. Forgiveness is about letting go of that which is holding you back in your life so you can live life to the fullest that God wants you to have. Because unforgiveness is a weight that drags you down. So forgiveness is about the victim. Forgiveness is about the one who suffers. Forgiveness is about being free from that person forever. That's what forgiveness is. But restoration is a totally different thing. And I'm going to be first to tell you that if someone has been a victim, that it is very likely, 99% likely, it will never be possible for that victim to have a restored relationship with the abuser. In fact, the safest avenue is for a victim never ever to be around the person that hurt them. That's how we understand. That's what we see. But God desires restoration. And that's where we find sometimes it's difficult. We want that person to be judged by God. We want revenge. How can we be a child of God? How can we be someone that cherishes the forgiveness we have if we are unwilling to say that God can forgive someone else? You see, it's when we forgive and let it go that we can let God be God and let Him make the decisions. And what is it that God wants? Jesus came into this world and He said this, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. What is an abuser but someone who is sick in the heart and sick in the head, broken and crooked, everything that God did not want them to be? Jesus came because there is no limit to the love that God has for his children. And that's something that we need to take to heart. We need to look at the world around us and see the evil, disgusting people that are in the world, the people that we say, I hope they get their just desserts, and realize that God, from his perspective, looks at them and said, I created them in my image. I loved them before they came into being, and I love them now, and I want them. In the same way, he looks at us and says, I loved you before you came into being. I brought you into being. I created you in my image. I love you, and I want you. He loves the wicked and the evil people just as much as he does the saved. And if Jesus didn't truly die for every person in this world, we need to lock the doors and go home and quit playing the game. Jesus went to the cross even for the abuser. And when you think about it, At whose hands did he suffer? Yeah, Pilate said, take him and discipline him and bring him back. And they took Jesus and they flogged him. They whipped him. Brought him back. Put a crown of thorns on his head and beat it down with a stick and put a purple robe on him. Put him out before the people. And when it came time that he was sentenced to death, those same soldiers, you don't say you're a king when they pledge their allegiance to Caesar. They scourged him, which was to literally fillet him with pieces of metal and leather and lead. They blindfolded him and punched him, mocking him and making fun of him. They nailed him to a cross 
and ridiculed him. I wasn't going to share this, so I learned something the other day. I told my wife about this. I was doing some reading, and I ran across something I never learned before. You know, twice Jesus has offered wine to drink. First time, it says he rejected it. Everybody always talks about it's wine mixed with gall. It's a painkiller, so he didn't want to have the numbness take over. No. Second time, they offered the same wine, different people, different, different sponge, as it were. They, you know, the second time, he took it. When he said, I thirst, they gave him wine, and he spoke loudly, it is finished. The first time, it was the Roman soldiers who did it. You know what sponge they use? Sponge on the stick given to them in their duty pack. It's what they wipe their butt with after they go to the bathroom. They were mocking him. Here, have a drink of wine. Taste my turd. They're mocking him, ridiculing him. They were horrible abusers. Jesus suffered at the hands of cruel, vindictive men. And when they hoisted him up on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And it says, then they cast, divided his clothes and cast lots for them. Who's he talking about? Those that are there at the foot of the cross casting lots for his clothes. He's asking the Father to forgive these cruel, vindictive, unjust, vile men for all they've just done to him. Because he loves them enough to die even for them. We have to come to the point where we understand that Jesus sees all of us through the same eyes of love and grace and that he wants every single person in this world to be restored to him. That doesn't mean we have to have a restored relationship with him. You shouldn't if they abused you. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't want them because God's looking at the long picture. He's looking at forever And he wants his children with him forever. Now having said all this, I realize that some of you sitting here, or maybe some of you watching online, have been on the other side. You aren't a victim, you're the ones who victimized. You were an abuser. You beat your wife. You molested a child. You did horrible things. I understand that there are some who are listening who maybe fall on that side of the equation. And that's a skeleton you want to stay, keep buried, don't you? You don't want anybody to know what your life used to be like. But that's the key. It's who you used to be. Because if Christ has come into your life, if Christ has changed you, if faith was born and the blood of Christ has washed over you, you're not who you used to be. And who you used to be is part of your testimony. Let me give you an example. We always hear about the Apostle Paul persecuting Christians. In your mind's eye, what does that look like? That means he went to places, he got people out of a jail cell, he put them in a cage and brought them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. No. He was right there egging on, kill Stephen. Here, let me hold your coat for you while she can throw the rock a little bit better. He went to places, got Christians, he tortured them, he beat them, or oversaw it at least. He manipulated and was cruel to them to get confessions out of them, and then he killed them. He was a horrible individual. He was an abuser. And Paul never forgot what he had done and where he had come from. He said, I am the least of the children of God. I'm the worst of sinners It became part of his testimony. This is how bad I was, and my life is a reflection of the power of God, how he can change someone. Do you understand, if you fall on that side of the equation, if you are one who's been guilty of hurting others, that God can use that testimony for his glory? Because you're not who you used to be. From God's perspective, it is forgiven. And as you live for Christ, your life is a living witness of the power of God to change someone. Don't run away from who you've been. Run to Christ and let Him use you for His glory. We stand here today together, and we all have a past. 
some of our lives, the past was painful. And some of, for some of us, the past was where we inflicted pain. But that's not what draws us together. It's not our past. Our past, we find solidarity under the cross. We come together because God has given us a future. And because his heart is a heart that desires to restore what is broken, to make straight what is crooked, to bring life where there would otherwise be death, because that applies to all of us. We stand together as the children of God in this world. May we find the peace that God wants us to have as we celebrate the forgiveness that he's accomplished for us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and a life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.